corruption. It ends today. Hello, and welcome to our Yellow Turban Let's Play. We are on turn 102, playing as Her Yi, the leader of the people. Now, anybody with a keen eye will notice that we're not in his starting location. And if we click on the records tab at the top here, we can take a look at the territories which we have owned. And if we go back to the start of our campaign in 190 CE, we can see that we were originally based in central China. However, I didn't want to be scrapping around in there, so decided to move and do the Great Migration and head into the previously unoccupied southeast coast, meaning we had free reign. Now you can see that over the last 19 years we have expanded into the empty territory relatively peacefully, and this playstyle really suits Her Yi, as he benefits from population bonuses, which is the perfect segue for us to look at the faction screen. The Yellow Turbans have a lot of unique building chains, and Her Yi is no exception. He has the Village Healer building tree, which provides bonuses to both population growth and public order. These buildings become invaluable as your empire grows and expands. In particular, the public order benefits help offset the negative effects of being densely populated. Her Yi also has a unique occupation option for when we take settlements, but more of that later in this video. And rounding it all out, we have access to a unique unit, the Yor Xia, heavy assault sword and shield infantry, which act as a strong front line with their high armor. Plus, the faction benefits of increased replenishment and reduced recruitment costs for large population mean that we can pop up armies very quickly. If we look at our faction rank, you can see that we're approaching the mid-game point. The Yellow Turban factions start at a much less advanced level, making it a very hard start. If we hover over the ranks, you can see that we can't make peace with any factions until the third rank. You might now be realising why we migrated our whole faction southeast. And if we hover over Empowered, our current rank, you can see that we've been able to set up trade agreements with regular factions, which has given a nice boost to our economy. The next rank, which we aren't too far from achieving, will trigger the three Han factions to declare themselves Emperor. If you want to see more details on this, check out our video on mid-game gameplay. The last rank for us to achieve is Enlightened, which will allow us to create alliances, coalitions and open vassalage options. These initial limited diplomacy options can make for an interesting but difficult campaign for the Yellow Turban Rebellion. Back to the campaign map, we can see that we have very high population in our settlements, which is giving us huge bonuses to our peasantry income and will benefit our recruitment in any future wars. Growing and biding our time on the coast means we can slingshot ourselves into existence and rid China of its corrupt rulers and free the people. Our first stage of the slingshot is to take on Liu Yao, a warlord with only two territories, so he makes an easy first target for our expansion. We will attack the trade port of Wanling, which will also damage his trade and income. We can see our leader, He Yi, currently moving up the Yangtze River with his army. Let's move on to the land and attack this resource. It has quite a large garrison of 2,640 to our 3,105 men. However, our forces are much higher tier and higher ranked. We'll just delegate this battle and we can get a closer look at our own units later in the video. In the post-battle screen, we can see that we have a new option, as part of Her Yi's unique faction traits. We can occupy and aid the wounded, which provides some nice benefits to help us integrate and expand into our new territory. The key things to note are the additional faction support and the huge population buff of 100,000. During this battle, a warrior has proven themselves and earned a promotion. For the Yellow Turbans, these sort of events are the main source of acquiring more powerful characters. Taking this settlement has also levelled up Hurriman, a key character that Hurriyu's faction starts with. Hurriman is a scholar, a character type unique to the Yellow Turban Rebellion which focuses on engaging enemy generals. We're going to level up and add the surprise attack skill, a battle ability which increases speed and melee damage. The extra skill points have also pushed Hurriman's expertise points to over 100, which now means he is a legendary character. Next turn, his name will turn gold to join the other legendary characters. This can happen to any character that has a skill path of over 100 points and means he will now be harder to kill. Now any magpies watching might be drawn to this bow over here, the Black Dragon, which we acquired from our weapon craftsman. 
These settlements have a percentage chance of dropping weapons we can equip onto our characters or sell to other factions. In fact, Huriyi also has one. We're going to upgrade the building chain here, which increases the percentage of a weapon drop. We will then end our turn and skip ahead two turns whilst we wait for our men to muster and move onto the capital of Luriao. So it took one turn for our men to muster and then another turn for us to move into Luriao's region. And seeing us attacking, his only way to ensure we don't destroy his faction was to become a vassal of Sun Jian and request that he goes to war against us as well. Now this really changes the dynamic here and gives us a real enemy to fight. As pretty much all factions hate us at the start of the game, it's not hard for vassals to start wars and means even small enemies can cause a lot of trouble, as all warlords see us as an enemy of China. Let's get Hui Yi headed back towards our lands, as we don't want to get caught undefended. Now to deal with this war. We can take a sneak peek at Sun Jian's situation in the diplomacy screen. What could a traitor have to offer me? And see that he has plenty of money, but a lack of food. So let's hit him where it hurts and try to prevent him creating an overwhelming army, as he will be able to outmuscle us. We can see to our west, he has an undefended livestock farm on our border. This feels like easy pickings that will reduce his replenishment rate and supplies. Let's create a second army. First, let's reclaim some of our money and cancel that weaponsmith upgrade. We have more pressing matters to deal with. Starting with our general, I'm going to choose Zhao Chong, a level 3 scholar to lead. Yellow turbans also have access to captains, so let's build a balanced army with an infantry captain and a spearman captain. Due to our high population, it only takes two turns to muster our army, and then a further two turns to move down to their settlement. As for Hui Yi, we're going to move inland just in case Sun Jian tries to attack our rich farmlands, before we move up towards the small town of Jindu. Before we end this turn, we have a reform we can research. The Yellow Turban Tech Tree works more similarly to a traditional Total War one, where you wait for the research before reaping the benefits. The three scrolls of reform represent the three aspects of the Yellow Turban philosophy, heaven, land, and people. The Book of Heaven offers new options for scholars and upgrades to esoteric and industry buildings. The Book of the People offers new options for healers and upgradings to housing and commerce. The Book of the Land offers new options for veterans and upgrades to farming and organization buildings. If we hover over some of the reforms, you can see that we can also unlock a lot of high tier units, some of which we already have. Each section is unlocked the higher your faction rank, with the final three reforms unlocking new court positions. We actually need to go into our court screen, so let's head over to it. The Yellow Turban Rebellion characters don't have a desire for leadership positions early on in the game, so you won't need to juggle those egos to keep your characters happy, meaning the positions are much less for political gain but for faction benefits. However, as your faction grows, they will start to care about those leadership positions. We need to replace our great commander, as our previous one just passed away. So let's select Gongdu, who is actually a leader of one of the other Yellow Turban Rebellion factions, which at this point during my playthrough has been destroyed, so he fled to join us. If we hover over him, you can see the benefits this provides. Now this leaves a local leader position open. We're going to choose Chiu Wei Zhang, as he provides a vital public order bonus. Local leaders are essentially administrators who will boost construction, population growth, and trigger other effects depending on your character's attributes. Now let's skip ahead a few turns while we move our armies into place. We're actually five turns on now, and Sun Jian's son, Sun Qian, has moved to defend their vital farmlands, so we haven't been able to progress. However, we have placed our army into ambush position in case he tries to make a tactical move into our lands. Hui Yi is now one turn away from Jindu, but it looks like Sun Jian was moving into our lands and we have managed to intercept him. We have quite a strong army and if we manage to cut the head off the snake, or tiger, we could push forward and free the people of Sun Jian's empire. Let's fight this battle to ensure we take down Sun Jian. Now on the battlefield, here we are at the Battle of Jindu, potentially the future resting ground of Sun Jian and his heir, Sun Tzu. We can see the town itself in the distance, shadowed by these pillar mountains. On the battleground itself, we can see the rich farmland with rice paddies and a river creating an interesting battleground to be used as a natural defense for Sun Jian. The forest between us also gives a perfect opportunity to stay hidden right up until we meet his army face to face, sword to sword. This battle gives us a really good chance to take a look at our unique units. Quite a few of these are unlocked from our tech tree. 
I'll leave the information panels up so you can pause and take a closer look if you'd like. Now let's take a look at our characters. First, her man, who as you can see is now a legendary character with his name in gold. He excels at engaging enemy generals with his match shui, plus his ranged capability with his bow, the Black Dragon. Next we have Gongdu, a veteran who can use his two-handed mace to hold out against the bulk of the forces. And rounding it all out we have Hur Yi, our leader and healer. He acts as more of a support unit and will inspire and support troops. However, should he get into combat, he has his spear, Ancestral Pledge, which we've unlocked during our campaign from the weaponsmith. Now onto our army. The Yellow Turban Rebellion army, as you'd expect, is not as structured as other armies. However, they do have a lot of strengths. Formations are only available through ancillaries, like we have here, or through special units like the Bringers of Righteousness. They're a medium glaive and bow infantry with both ranged and combat capability. They've used their wealth to buy their own armor and weapons, and they can be placed into a formation as you can see here. The Yorxia are ranks of the most experienced Yellow Turban warriors and the fight against tyranny. With their strong armor and shields, they're perfect frontline infantry and start with guerrilla deployment. Contrary to that, we have the People's Warband, who are perfect for assault with their dual swords, but weak against ranged fire. Made up of merchants and craftsmen, they carry dual sabers and armor looted from city armories. Rounding out Hurry's retinue, we have two units of Yellow Turban horsemen. Made up of brigands and bandits, they now fight for the Yellow Turban cause. They aren't the strongest cavalry, but are fast and pack a punch with a charge. Now onto Gongdu's retinue. He has an item which allows for his entire retinue to have guerrilla deployment. First, the Virtuous Nobleman, the only axe cavalry in the game. These noblemen have renounced their former warlords to seek justice and redemption and make excellent flanking cavalry. At this point, I'm now going to change the unit cards to the alternate version now so you can see both options and compare them for the Yellow Turban units. Next, we have the Yellow Turban Spearmen. Former bandits, they now fight for the cause. With their spears and shields, they deflect both cavalry and arrows. Which brings us on to the Horseback Huntsmen. As you'd assume, previously local hunters, they now fight against tyranny as well. They make excellent skirmishers, but should be kept out of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Fellow hunters, the men of the forest, make for perfect archers. They don't suffer from terrain penalties, so could prove vital in this fight with trees, hills and rivers to deal with. Next to those, we have the Yellow Turban Archers, a mid-tier archer unit. Their raiders and idle soldiers will actually burn down nearby buildings. Finally, on to Hurriman's Battle. The Militia of Virtue are martial arts students who have mastered the use of the staff. They make a great front line as they are highly skilled at blocking melee attacks. However, they cannot adopt any advanced formations. Next, the unbreakable Yellow Sky Heralds. Beneath their yellow robes and Taoist charms, they are protected by light armour. Their devotion to the cause can tip them into an uncontrollable frenzy. Now for the backbone of any good Yellow Turban army, especially in the early game. These Yellow Turban Warriors have been labelled outlaws by the corrupt warlords, but really, they've been pushed out of their lands and now fight to free others from oppression. And to round out Hurriman's retinue, we have two units of Archery Masters. Each archer has spent years mastering the bow with both training and Taoist meditation. Their volleys of arrows even reduce the speed of enemy units. We're going to utilise Gongdu's guerrilla deployment and put his forces over here, along with the Yorxia. Then the rest of our army will remain hidden and approach through the forest. I will leave you with some shots of the battle and you can see these units in action. As we saw, we defeated Sun Jian and Sun Tzu, and have managed to capture them after the battle. We now have a choice, but do we really? The only thing to do is to kill Sun Jian and his next in line, Sun Tzu. 
Whilst doing this, we will gain both of their horses, including Xinjiang's unique one, Heavenly Fire. We've also got access to his ancient silver sword, and I've added some footage showing Hurriman and Hurriyi with their new prizes. We've won this battle, but it's only the beginning of the war on tyranny, and it will be a long time until the skies are yellow. Thanks for watching this Yellow Turban Rebellion campaign let's play. If you want to play the Yellow Turban faction for yourself, you can get them for free by pre-ordering Total War Three Kingdoms or purchasing up to a week after launch. They're also available as part of this beautiful collector's edition.